Good morning, you guys. Uh, thank you for having me here. Today, I'd like to talk to you guys about the heart. Today, I'd like to show you guys that you guys have heart disease. So if you guys would just open up your Bibles to Jeremiah 17, verse 9 and 10. Again, that is Jeremiah 17, verse 9 and 10. It says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways, according to his, the fruit of his doing. Did you know that 600,000 people die of heart disease every year in the United States? That's one in four deaths. So I want to ask you, how do you get heart disease? People think that heart disease comes in different ways. Some ways is lack of exercise, McDonald's, Faith School's meatloaf. There's many different ways to get heart disease. But one important way is you can get it from your family line. If your parents had heart disease, it can be passed on to you. So just as heart disease can come from your family, you got spiritual heart disease from your family. Jesus came to give you a new heart. So you ask yourself, how did you get that heart disease? I'm going to tell you right now. In the beginning, Satan gave it to Eve. If you look back in the Genesis account, Satan deceived Eve. In Genesis 3.13, it says, The Lord said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Beguiled is another way for deceit, which is lying. Satan lied to Eve and saying, Aren't you, you know, God will give you, you'll be like God, and you'll have the knowledge of good and evil. And then she ate the fruit, and then she gave it to a man. So after that, God saw man's heart just like that. He saw it as lying and deceitful. In Genesis 6, 5, it tells us that continually man's thoughts were evil. Let's look at Jacob. Jacob in Genesis chapter 27, he was a deceitful man. He wanted Esau's blessing. He was the second born. So naturally, the first born gets the blessing. But instead, Jacob, he put hair on his, on his arm, and he walked into the room to his father Isaac, which was blind, and he lied to his father, saying that he was Esau. Is your heart right today? Have you ever lied to get what you wanted or to get someone to, someone to get your way? So let's look at Jacob. Jacob, he sowed in lying. He sowed in deceitfulness. Galatians 6, 7 says, whatever a man sows, he also reaps. So we look later in Jacob's life when he went out to get a wife. He wanted Rachel. He was going to serve seven years for Rachel. But Laban deceived Jacob as well. Instead of giving him Rachel, he gave him Leah. So then he had to work another seven years to get Rachel. That's 14 years. But then he got deceived again, and he had to work another seven years to get the flock that he so worked for. So instead of seven years, he worked for 21 years. He sowed in lying, and he reaped lying. Lying has a dangerous, a dangerous effect on people, but it's from the heart. It said the heart is deceitful above all things. Have you ever lied to people to get your side on an issue? I have. So the Bible tells us in Matthew 5, 8, that without a pure heart, you, will, you won't see God. It says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. But the Bible tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things. So how can we see God? Revelation 21, 8 says, no cowardly, no idolaters, no adulterers, no liars will get in the kingdom of heaven. All will have their part in the lake of fire. Is your heart deceitful? Have you lied? Because the heart is deceitful above all things. So how do we get a new heart? How can you get a new heart? In surgery, you have to get someone else's heart before you can live. Someone else has to give you their heart in order for you to have a new heart. God tells us in Ezekiel eleven nineteen, 19, I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within them. And I will take the 
stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh. Do you want that new heart? Do you want to stop from lying? God is willing to give you a new heart. Jesus came to give you a new heart, to clear you from the heart disease that you got from the beginning, from the lying heart that you had before. Because if you sow in line, you're going to reap in line. And without a pure heart, you won't see God. So I'm going to leave you with this. Jesus makes all things new. Are you ready for it to be you? morning. Hope everybody's doing well. Uh, if you'll please turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. What I want to talk to you today about is sin. And whose sin did Jesus take care of? We all sin, but it's what we do after we sin that makes us or breaks us. Like, especially in my life, I have all these mindsets that I developed from growing up with 10 years of drugs and alcohol and everything like that. And so now, uh, on a daily basis, I still battle with those old mindsets trying to re renew my mind now. But in those times, I still fall. So what do I do? Do I, do I let them keep me at a place to where I just dwell on that? Or do I move forward? Do I let it make me or break me? The scripture says we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And we always have to remember what Jesus Christ did on the cross. He took care of the sin for us. If we sin, we must get back up. Luke 5, 32 says this. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. We must answer the call. When we go through things, when we, when we do something that we know we're not supposed to do, hopefully we have that convicting voice in our ear and say, hey, we need, we need to recognize that that wasn't right. We need to go on. We need to, we need to move ahead. And when we hear that voice, we have to answer to it. We have to react to it. Job 42, 5 through 6 says this, I have heard of thee by the hearing of my ear, but I knew mine Mine eye seeth thee, wherefore I, ab I abhor myself, and repent in the dust. I looked up the word abhor. It literally means, to like, it's like a mindset of realizing that I'm nothing. Realizing that, that really, he had, he had to realize that, Job had to realize that God was everything. We must acknowledge that we need his help. 
Matthew 21, 28 through 29 says, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterwards he repented and went. We must listen to our father and go forward. Sometimes God will tell us things. So he'll say, you know, this is where you need to go. And right off the bat of our head, we, maybe we don't like it. Maybe we, we go against it. But it goes back to that convicting voice where we say, all right, Lord, I'm going to do the right thing. We must understand and believe that he took care of all of our sins. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For the whole world, right? For all of us. Sin brings death, but Jesus brought life. 1 John 2, verse 2 again, it says this, And he himself, I don't know if I read that one in the beginning. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but also for those of the whole world. When Jesus died on the cross and he paid that price, he paid for the whole world. One thing that we have to think of is that the whole world wasn't sinning at exactly the same time that Jesus died. So that tells us that his death and resurrection paid the price then, and it carries on to now. First John 3, 5 says, and you know that he was manifested to take away our sin, and in him is no sin. The entire purpose is to free us from sin. Jesus took care of sin once and for all. We must walk with a heart that listens to God, a mind that is set on God, and action to get us where our heart and mind is with, is with Jesus. There's a quote that I found from a, a man named Randy Alcorn. He said this, God's grace never encourage us, encourages us to sin or live in sin. On the contrary, it empowers us to say no to sin and yes to truth. Let us abide in the grace of Jesus and not our issues of life. You guys, please, please turn with me in your Bibles to Romans 5.8. Again, that's Romans 5.8. It's only when you have an intimate, personal experience that you learn about the person you love. I know him so well that I can finish a sentence. Tell what are you thinking. I know what you expect from me. I don't even have to sit around waiting to know what you want. Feel his pulse, know his heartbeat, and his desires. The only way to know him is to spend time alone. Now I can please him. So I may know you in your death and power of resurrection. <laughs> When you know him, you don't offer, you sacrifice. Offering is giving what you like. Sacrifice is giving what he likes. And not just any sacrifice, but meaningful sacrifice. I want this to be woven into the very fabric of my life. I want it to be the strands that hold my life together. I want it to be the agenda and the goal of my life. 
I want it to be, get, be the beginning and the end of my life, and I want it to be the reason I start my race, run my race, and finish my race. If you're at Romans 5.8, say A-O. Let's go. All right. Because God demonstrates his love, his own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. My question today is, do you know him? <clears throat> um, anyone can love Megan Fox, but not everyone can love a hooker. Only God can, and that's why his love trumps every other love. Romans 5.8 says that while we were sinners, meaning that while we were leaving, living to please ourselves and do whatever we felt necessary, uh, drinking, getting high, having sex, <clears throat> Christ died for us. His love is a peacemaker, his love is a transformer, and his love is an emancipator who frees slaves. Um, the question is not whether you love him or not, it is not whether you will serve him or not, and it's not whether you will sacrifice for him or not, but the question is, do you know him? Um, the word of God is God's love t letter to us, and it convicts us. Um, we're going to try something. Um, I'm going to tell you not to do something, and we're going to see what happens. So uh, don't think of a purple elephant playing with a rubber ducky. What everyone just do? You thought of it. Because when I tell you to do something, immediately the f your first instinct is to do it. So if I'm always shoving law down your throat and rules, you're always going to be thinking on those things. And if you keep your concentration on that, you're bound, to, you're bound to fail and then condemn yourself. When we take our eyes off Jesus and the cross and start looking at the law and try to please God by our own works, we fall. We need the Father's love to convict us <coughs> um, when we're wrong because our love can do nothing for us. By knowing God's love for us, uh, we will be convicted because we want to do whatever we can to please the Father. This is like Peter and John. Peter was always boasting in his love for God, saying how much he loved him. And then when it came down to it and Jesus went to the cross, Peter denied him and ran away. Um, but John was always boasting in the Father's love for him because he, he understood that his love really didn't matter. And it was all about Christ's love towards him that mattered. And uh, when we grasp that, we're going to do whatever we can to please him because we, we're going to love him back. <clears throat> um, if we keep our eyes on the Father and on his love towards us and get to know him through prayer and his word, he will convict us and cause us to realize that the lover loves us so much and that will make us examine ourselves and that is what brings conviction. After we're convicted, we're compelled. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 15 says, For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Paul was so compelled by God's love for him that it, it took over him. It dominated, and it was almost as if he had no choice but to preach the gospel. When we gain an understanding of God's love for us, we see, feel so loved that our lover, we want our lover to feel the same way, so we feel compelled to change. Um, I've had friends compelled by the lover, by the love of their mothers. Um, they've been doing drugs and stuff like that, and they realize that the only person um, that ever, you know, loved them in their eyes was their mother, and it, and it caused them grief to know that what they were doing was tearing her apart, and so they quit because of the love of their mother. Um, love compelled them to do it. To feel compelled is to almost feel obligated or forced to do something. When we receive the gospel, we share it because God's love compels us to do so. After we're compelled by God's love, we propel. And uh, Christ's love propels us. It's what makes us thrive or move forward to be all that we can be. Love never just makes an overcomer. It makes me more than an overcomer. It will never just want you to be mediocre, but the best at what you do because you want your lover to be proud. For in all things, we are more than overcomers through not him who empowers us, strengthens us, or helps us, but him who loves us. Um, another thing I'd like to add is that if you're, if you're trying to scratch the love itch with the sex utensil, you're always going to fall short and live a frustrated life. Don't sell yourself short. Don't seek after these worldly desires expecting to find love because it's false. The only true agape love is in Christ Jesus. He's what we need. And uh, loving the wrong things will cause pain because the perishable will perish and the tangible will be taken away, but the intangible will remain forever. No one else sees it. No one else understands it. No one else can experience it but you because it's intangible. In conclusion, people always say that the Lord chastises those he loves. But what they forget to say is that he also pours out the wine and oil when I'm hurting.
both functions have to go hand in hand because if, if not, it's not love. It's simply abuse in the name of love or abuse in the name of law and justice. Love that tears down but doesn't build up isn't love at all. It's prejudice. The rear of a hammer is used to pull down and tear down, but the end or other end of the hammer builds up. Love corrects and tears down the wrongs and yet builds me up. <coughs> the two ends of the hammer are the two ends of love. Sometimes we do some things in our lives and they need fixing, so God will tear them down, but you can always be sure that he's going to turn the hammer around and he's going to start building us back up. He's not going to tear us down and then send us on our way. Christ's love convicts, compels, and propels us. Thank you. Hello. Okay. Um, my title is um, The Importance of the Words We Speak. Um, my subject is power. That's the word powerful. Um, if everybody can just uh, turn to Proverbs 25.11, and just keep their finger on it because I'm going to get to it in a few minutes. Um, <coughs> have you ever hurt someone with haste, careless of your words? Have you ever spread a rumor that turned out not to be true? Have you ever said bad things about someone because you were angry at them? Have you ever said something to hurt someone's feelings and heard them say, you take that back? You can't take it back, can you? Once you have said it, it's said. We're all made mistakes, and we've all made mistakes, haven't we? Words are important, a part of life. They are apples of gold. Did you know that there are many, many subjects that show many Many subjects that show that, that we speak about 1,600 to 1,800 words per day. Words can make, a happy, make you happy or sad. They can make you angry or feel, fill us with joy. They can make us laugh or they can make us cry. They can heal or they can hurt. The words we speak can be very powerful. So we need to be very careful on how we use them. The book of Proverbs gives us so many guides on how to use our words for the glory of God and how not to use them. In fact, the subject of the tongue and how we use our words is one of the most important subjects of this book. Many verses in Proverbs show us how words are used, both good and bad. 
so many so many experiences from proverbs show us that words or the tongue may be used to talk too much do that a lot um may be used for evil may be used for lying may be used for gossip um may be used for fighting or they may be used for apples of gold one of the verses proverbs 20 25:11 you guys uh can turn back to that a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver king solomon gave us all gave us a lot of wisdom in this short verse <coughs> about wisdom of about wise speech first it shows that wise words are like gold wise words are val- valuable this word this wise words are like apples of gold in that their value and beauty are just jewels How many of you how many of you your words this last week were words of encouragement how many of your words were words to build up how many times in this last week did you find it necessary to to tear down or and destroy are you like are you the kind of person that others other people are go are glad to see coming into the room <laughs> are you the the kind of person that causes other people to turn their face away One reason it means may be that they see you as a <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> How blessed are you if you're if you use your tongue to lift up the encouraged the people around you like your apples of gold so why does god care so much about the words we use it is because the words our words are the gift from him they are apples of gold words where were pointed at the beginning of time god spoke the god spoke to us told us to use words oh my goodness god spoke to us and told us to use words that would build us up encourage us not to make us fall down and make us regret the next day what we're supposed to do he wants us to listen to him read his word and tell many as many people as we can what the meaning of his word means because there's millions of people out there that are using the f bomb the the s bomb 
all these other slanged words and curse words. And it's not glorifying. All it does is show their true colors. All it shows is their hurt, their pain, their suffering. And they need, they need God. So let's show them God. Good morning, everyone. I really appreciate your efforts to go out and put these sermons together because they're more than just a grade in homiletics class. I want you all to turn to Romans 8, numbers 36 to 39. We'll get to that in just a minute. But first, I want to bring something to your attention. As Christians today, we are faced with this world and with the trials it has to offer. And the devil does not plan to make those trials easy on us. We have family, friends, frustration, work. Home, school, all thrown at us. And the devil wishes to use those frustrations to drag us down and defeat us. But yet, the chapter 8 of Romans says otherwise. We have victory. We are, more, we are no more defeated by the schemes of the devil, and we are more than conquerors. The chapter 8, numbers 36 to 39, goes like this. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor present, nor future, nor powers, neither height, nor death, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. How powerful is that? That's a sermon right in itself, and that's exactly what I'm using it as. So I want to ask you something. Do you have this victory that Paul spoke of? Paul encountered doubt within the Roman church. In their own mind, they were already defeated. They faced this death all the day long. The Roman church even said it themselves. But Paul has immediate rebuke to it. No. No is his immediate rebuke. Because he knows that they are more than conquerors. The church needs to stop being defeated. We are more than sheep being led to the slaughter. The modern church thinks that Satan is waiting to strike. But the truth is, at the cross, he was defeated. When you think of a snake, you think of those large fangs. But truthfully, at the cross, that Satan, that serpent, was defanged. He was defeated forevermore because we are conquerors through him. We currently fear fangless snake, an enemy who's already defeated. And sadly, we are letting his scare tactics get the best of us some days. Luke 10, 19. I have given you authority to trample on snakes, scorpions, and to overcome all the power, and nothing will harm you. I have given you all authority. Not some authority, not a little bit, but all authority to overcome all powers. And what does the last part say? Nothing will harm you. Nothing will harm you when you abide in him. God, thank you for that. We will come over all powers of the wicked one. That means all. And that says nothing will harm you by no means. We are more than conquerors through him. Verse 37 in Romans 8. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Those words, through him who loved us, let's paraphrase that, through Jesus Christ our Lord. It does not say through ourselves we are more than conquerors. It does not say through our flesh, but it says through Jesus Christ our Lord we are more than conquerors. <sighs> Those words dictate that we cannot go through our life on our own strength. We need to lean on God more than our own works more than our own understanding, and more than our own flesh. 
We need to lean on him in all things that he has to offer because we are more than conquerors. Through Christ Jesus, the devil is defeated at the cross. Not today when you're going through that trial. Not yesterday when the devil comes at you with his schemes, scare tactics, and lies. At the cross, the devil was defeated. By myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Do you know who spoke those words? Jesus Christ himself spoke those words. He even had to admit, by myself, I can do nothing. But my father who sent me, I can do everything. That last part, but he who has sent me, means to press on and resist what the scare tax of the devil has against us. For the king of kings has sent each and every one of you. Nothing can separate us from God's love. Read this, for I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither present nor future, nor any powers, height, depth, anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is nothing that can separate us from God's love. Nothing. Did you hear that word? In all of creation. There's nothing that can overcome us when we abide in him. Not even the powers of life and death itself. Because he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. And he who is in us has overcome the grave. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Doesn't say we'll be given victory through our means, but it says thanks be to God who gives us victory. That word victory in the Greek means to utterly vanquish, utterly defeat the schemes of the devil. That we have already triumphed. The church has already conquered the means of the devil at the cross. Paul encountered doubt within the Roman church because they were human. In their own mind, they were already defeated. They faced death all the day long. So I want to ask you something. Do you have this victory that I speak of? With every fiber of my being, I can tell you I do. We are given victory through him who has sent us. Five weeks ago, as of yesterday, I got into a car crash. You guys all know that. The devil wanted to defeat me. But through Christ, I have victory. I've learned this scripture since then. And I could take this, and this could be a scripture for my life. Genesis 50, 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This may seem familiar, and what a popular phrase amongst pastors. What the devil has done in trying to defeat us, God has turned it for good. Because we are more than conquerors through him. Nothing can keep you from the love of Christ. And when you abide in him, not are you defeated by the devil. Nothing can separate us from God's love. Because we have this victory. Because we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Um, would you please turn with me to Psalm 107, verse 6? Or 13, or 19, or 28. It all says the same thing. It says, Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. So, looking at this um, passage, 
of scripture, I noticed that it says that same exact verse four times. So it must be pretty important. Um, but first, I want to give you some background. Uh, when I was little, a few years, well, a few years ago, anyway, um, I was running into my pool, and there's a lip that goes around my pool, and I caught my foot underneath the lip and tripped into my pool, and I actually got like a huge cut on my foot. It hurt so bad, and my little sister like had to carry me to the ladder. Like I was in shock, and I almost passed out. And we're screaming like my mom's name as loud as possible. We're like, Mom. Well, she didn't come for, like, five or ten minutes, and we were like, Mom, why didn't you come? And she was like, uh, I thought you guys were playing a game. And I was like, okay, cool, Mom. But, all right, so she redeems herself by this, because every time I lose something, how many of us lose stuff? And who do you go to? Your mom. Uh, well, I do anyway. Like, I always say, Mom, where's my cell phone? Mom, where's my license? And she always seems to find it. So just as a child calls on their mom, to find stuff when they're in trouble or whatever. It says in Psalm 107 that they cried to the Lord in their time of trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. So what is our reaction to trouble? So I was talking to a few people, and they said that they either work out. Sometimes I go for a run or shopping. I don't know. Do you have different emotions? Do you get mad? Do you get sad? Do you get fearful when you're in trouble? Our first and initial reaction should be to cry out to God. This uh, last break, during Thanksgiving break, I lost my keys in the ocean. And it was the only uh, set of keys that I had for my car. So I wasn't really sure (laughs) how I was going to get back in my car and drive away. But um, we were searching for at least an hour, and we couldn't find them. And so we finally just stopped and prayed and asked God to help us find the keys. And we did. So, well, I mean, it 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 was the bay. (laughs) <laughs> God's good. So um, if we had just called upon him from the beginning, I probably would have found my keys a little bit quicker. <laughs> um, but I want to talk to you guys about what the importance of crying is. Because this verse could have said they yelled out to God. They spoke out to God. They ran to God. But it says they cried out. And it says it four times in four separate verses. I think that it's important, and I, I'm taking this literally, like they literally are bawling their eyes out in front of God, and um, I think it's important because there's an intimacy in crying. I'm not going to just cry, well, for me anyway, I'm not going to just cry in front of anyone. If I trust you, I'll probably cry in front of you, or I don't know, like if, if something like traumatic happens, I guess I will, but I find intimacy in crying. It shows vulnerability when I'm at my lowest. Um, it's helplessness. It's brokenness. It's desperation. But it, it's also a breaking point. But it can also be a breakthrough. I know that a lot of times when I cry, it pretty much helps me get over whatever's going on. Pretty much. Because crying's healing. Um, so what do we expect from others when we cry? Because, I mean, I'm sure we often cry in front of other people. Well, what are you expecting? A hug? A pat on the back? An encouraging word? Sympathy? Pity? Ultimately, we want a solution, right? When we cry, we want a solution. Something to make us feel better. Something to make the situation better. We want our troubles to be over with, and we, do, we want to be delivered. Maybe we've been looking at people. I know that a lot of times I look to people to help me in my times of trouble, and I don't, I don't go to God first. Um, people can't ultimately help us the way that we need to be helped. They can't save us the way that we need to be saved, and they can't be our solution. The truth is God's the only one that can deliver and heal us. So why does God deliver us? He does this because he loves us. Because he's our deliverer, our defender, the only person that we can truly depend on. Through our, he- our tears, we are healed and delivered. That's why it's so important to cry, because there's, there's healing in tears. Psalm, um, pre- in the, in the um, first portions of Psalm 107, it says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. So God loves us, and that's why he wants to deliver us. And he doesn't want to see us hurting. This is... We don't want to see our friends hurting, but ultimately we can't be the ones to solve what they're going through. When or if you're at your low point, I mean, maybe you're at a low point right now. Maybe you're going through trouble right now. Maybe you're super overwhelmed by these tests that are coming up. You're super overwhelmed to go back home. I don't know what your situations are like at home. But if you're going through distress or trouble, just cry out to God because he will deliver you. Psalms 107, verse 6, and verse 13. And verse 19 and 28 all say, 
They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. So just be encouraged by that, because if you cry out to God, if you get on your knees and you cry out to God, he's going to deliver you, because he loves you. This morning we're going to speak about the amazing paradox. Last time I preached to you, I left most people and I preached about in hell, but we're going to preach about today, we're going to talk about today how to keep you out of there. The text is in John 12, and we're going to use several verses, 12 through 15. What does the average American Christian look like today? He is kind, mildly energetic middle-class Republican who has a good retirement program. He works for a good company, goes to church every Sunday to get God to bless all his endeavors, has a peaceful, quiet, and basically moral and prosperous life. He has at least two cars. He lives in the suburbs and has a white picket fence around his yard. His children all went to Sunday school, whether they needed it or not. He buys his suits, which he wears to church and to funerals at Sears. He is at, not Walmart, sorry. He is, a, he is appalled at the conditions of the nation and cannot believe the way the young people today act in dress. His li- he lives his life in shades of gray, and it lacks much of the spark of divine light and color. Today's Christian wants a God who will protect and even advance his lifestyle so that he can have more of, the pl- of what pleasures and what comforts him. It is these things that he does to glorify himself. And it is to these Christians that John 12 was written. In John 12, 11, many Jews and Gentiles had gathered around Bethany to see and hear Jesus due to the fact that he had just raised Lazarus from the dead. Verse 11 tells us that many were going over to Jesus and believed who welcomed Jesus into the city as their king. He was going to liberate them from all their oppression from the Romans. They saw him as his deliverer. You see, they, they too were looking for a Christ who would give them great stature, who would give them world power, world domination. And then in verse 23, Jesus says what they were all waiting to hear. They, he says to them, for the hour, for the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Yes, this is exactly what they had been hearing. They knew exactly what this phrase meant. You see, they had been schooled in the book of Daniel. From early childhood, they had learned that the Son of Man from Daniel 7.13 would come and would be given authority, glory, and sovereign power. So this announcement was great news to the crowd. The trumpet of eternity had just sounded. The march of heaven was about to begin. The victory was just around the corner. By glorified, they meant that all they had dreamed about in this world concerning their freedom, their stature, their wealth, and their power would now be provided. But by glorified, Jesus meant the cross. That's powerful. That is why in the next few statements of Jesus, he left the people staggered and could not believe their ears. It is the same paradox that we face today. Man looks on glory as a conquest, the acquisition of power, the right to rule. Jesus looks on it as death to yourself, the spending of life, and the serving of others all summed up in the cross. Point number one, life comes only by death. It's a paradox. The first thing that Jesus tells these Jews concerning his glory must have jolted them into the reality. Verse 24, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground 
and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it it dies. It, if it dies, it produces many seeds. The kingdom principle that Jesus taught here, I find glaringly missing from the kingdom principles in books today. The principle that life only comes by death. This is the principle that Jesus will soon demonstrate for us in living colors on the cross. It was the death of Stephen and other martyrs that the new church exploded out into the world. Everything they had come to expect in their lives and their time by the world's standards had to die before real life and the glory of God could be released. Ooh. When you first come to Jesus, you must, your old nature must die before you can live. That principle holds true for the rest of your spiritual pilgrim. Point two, only by spending your life do you keep it. Here is another principle that Jesus shared. Shock their hearers. Verse 25, the man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life here on this earth will keep it for eternity. History is full of people who have decided it's better to burn out than to rust out for him. Third point, that greatness and honor only comes by servanthood. The next principle he taught was in verse 26. Whoever serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, my servant will be also. My father, my father will honor those who serve me. Not what you can do for yourself, it's what you can do for him. Jesus said three things that stood in sharp contrast with his world then and now concerning his glory and the heart of real Christian faith. Die to live, spend it to keep it, honor and glory comes by serving. These three principles that he talked about in verses 27 through 28. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say to my father? Save me from this hour? No, it was from, it was from, this, it was from this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorifies your name. These words were hard to receive by so many. They abandoned him at this point. Many believed, verse 42 says, even among the leaders, but they were afraid of, listen to this. This is important for today. They were afraid of losing the praises of men, so they abandoned him. But three lessons about the kingdom will always stand. The only way to life is through death. The only, only by spending your life do you get to keep it, and honor and greatness will only come through serving him. I know you guys are all doing great, so you're all preaching. I'm kind of hungry, so you have to bear with me a little bit. Um, our text today is going to be in Romans chapter nine, uh, 7, Romans chapter 7, verse 19. Romans 7, 19. I'm going to finish off with what I started last time. a little bit. All right. Romans 7.19 reads, I'm reading out of NLT. It's seven, I, want to, <laughs> I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. It's time to step it up. It's time to go hard, and it's time to hook on. Hook on, baby. Have you ever been in a situation where you've, 
listen to the voice of God. He's spoken to you in a still, small voice. He said, he's saying in a service or any time, saying, go pray for this person. Go give this person a w- word of encouragement. Lift their spirit up. Say, all right, Lord, I hear your still, small voice. I'm going to do just what you say. So you go over, you pray for this person, you give them a word of encouragement. And, but times come when, um, there's also times when we'll, we will be tempted. And it's during those times, the Lord will still speak to us if we're listening. But some, a lot of times it's going to be in a louder voice because he wants us to flee from wickedness. He wants to run away. He wants us to get out. But it's sometimes I find sometimes, personally, it's that time, you know, we we uh, we don't listen. We choose to have selfish, selfish self control. Let me share something with you. We don't have the place to pick when we listen to the voice of God. We can't turn him on or off. He's not like the clapper. You clap your hands and he's off, and you clap him back on and he's on. It doesn't work that way. He's either God all the time. Or zero percent of the time. And just to help us young people understand it better, and people in this world, say we get, you guys are all going to get married someday because you're in the ministry. And um, that's where you can keep it, take it, run with it. And um, so check this out. Your wife asks you to do something, but you only do want to do the stuff that she asks, some of the stuff that she asks you to. You don't want to do everything she asks you to. So it works the same way with God, you know. If you want a good relationship, you got to be obedient. You want to prosper, you got to be obedient. You want to grow, listen to what you're told and do it. And then also I find if we're not obedient, we get hurt. This is why God, because sin will hurt us. This is why we don't, if we, do, if we give in to sin, we're going to hurt ourselves and hurt others. That's why... We serve a God that's not about hurting, but about healing and restoration. So it's truly time to hook on. Hook on to the power to resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It's time to hook on to the life that Jesus gives and gives it more abundantly. It's time to walk in the light and shine in the darkness. We have the power. We have the very same power that Christ used to resurrect himself from the dead. It dwells in each and every one of you. That same living power, that same Holy Ghost power. You are full of his power. The same power. Jesus gives life. We serve life and not death. Jesus conquered death. He conquered hell. And he conquered the grave. And the only, there's only one thing that comes from sin. Death. Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. We serve life, not death. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. So let us hold on to that gift of eternal life. You know, we don't serve sin. We serve Jesus Christ. Sometimes after being completely free from something, maybe a stronghold back in our past, we're completely free. And for some reason, we want to go back back to our past and mess around with it, mess around with it, play with it a bit, try to bring that thing that Jesus already died for in the grave and resurrect it and play with it some. Things that have already been conquered. In the law, the law gives the knowledge of sin but it's not the cure. The eye has the power to see things in a room, but it, without light, it is useless. So we can know what to do, but lack the, lack the power to do it. We can find this power to do what is right. We have the power to live a righteous life. How many are alive today? All of us. We have the same authority, same power over sin, and someday we will reign in righteousness. We can claim the Holy, the same Holy Ghost that Jesus healed with, open blind eyes, called the lame to walk, and made the dumb to talk. So when we are drawn away, like it says in James 1, 14, 15, you are drawn away by your own desires, enticed with these desires give birth to death and sinful actions. And when the sin is allowed to grow, it causes birth to death. Sin is like a disease or a cancer. Mess with it long enough and you'll catch it. And if you don't get rid of it, it will kill you. Sin produces one fruit, death. But as we serve the one that gives the breath of life, the one that created us, the way, the truth, and the life. We don't serve sin. We are made, we are men and women of God, men like Samuel, men, men like David, men like Samson. In Hebrews 11, 30, 11, chapter 30, chapter 11, verse 33. But these 
people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned into their strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Something also in God's word that says you can do all things through Christ. You can do all things through Christ, but you cannot do all things. But you can do all things through Christ. If there was any life in sin, I would take my Holy Ghost shotgun that I found and I'd shoot it in the face. I'd shoot this sin in the face. I'd shoot Delilah in the face and she'd be dead. I don't serve sin. We serve life. In Romans chapter 6, verse 22. I don't know if I can just find it. Okay, and the Lord, Good morning, everyone. I trust that you're all doing well. Would you please open your Bibles to Romans chapter 118. Romans chapter 118. And it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. The title of my sermon is Ignorance is Bliss. So, have you ever wondered how God can judge those who have never been told about him, those who have never heard the gospel? A lot of, when we think about when people are in trouble or being judged, like take kids for example, they always use ignorance as an excuse. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to eat those cookies. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to draw on the wall. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to cut my own hair. And just as parents can't get mad at their children for doing something that, they, that is wrong when they didn't know that it was wrong, God can't judge us when we do something, when we sin unknowingly. So, I think I probably should have done this first. Okay. I have three glasses that are going to represent three different types of people. Water represents truth. So, our first type of person are the people who have never heard of God before. And the amount of truth that they are given is only 10%. The second one are, say, the Jews or Muslims who have about 50% of truth. And then the last one are born-again Christians who have 90% of truth. God judges us on the amount of truth that we hold, not the amount that we lack. So for the born-again Christian who has 90%, he's not going to be judged on the, on the 10% that he lacks. He's going to be judged on the 90% that he had and chose to throw away. Okay. And the same with the Jews and the Muslims. In Romans 1.20, says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. All men have what's called intuitive faith. Now the Indian has his 10% of truth through what is revealed to him by nature. Uh, he has what is called intuitive faith. Job 12, 7 to 10 says, But now ask the beasts, and they will teach you, and the birds of the air, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you, and the fish of the sea will explain to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this, in whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? This is but one proof of how we are without excuse. Even
even if there were no one to witness the loss, the creation would prove the existence of a creator. All men have light. Some are directly in the light, and some are in the shadow with indirect light. But we have all been lightened by the word of God. All men are responsible for the light he holds. God is not going to judge us on what we don't know, but what we do know. It's when truth is held unrighteously that it's considered sin. A man does not feel guilty when he doesn't do what he didn't know he was supposed to do. The three, the three different types of people that we talked about before don't feel guilty for the percentage of truth that they don't have, but rather it's when they hold the truth and don't do what is right that they blame themselves and feel guilty. It's when you hold values for either yourself or for others to live up to, and when they fail, you judge them or yourself. Just like if I have the standard that people shouldn't lie to me, and when they do, they break that standard and are judged for it. The Indian felt guilty, but not from religion, but from his intuitive faith. Romans 1, 21 to 25 says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him, not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to a corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own heart to dishonor their bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped, ser worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever." It is only when we go against the truth that we have or the standards we have been given in our, that we have made in our lives is considered sin and are judged accordingly. So, if we take this ink and we apply it on the ink that we have, we notice that the only except the 90% that's already there, it doesn't infect the 10% that isn't there. So, this part is a little bit gruesome, so I gave Sherry permission to leave if she wants to. But uh, there was a show on TV that was about Indians from Mexico who had never heard of the gospel before. And they had these big totem poles with ropes from hanging from the top all the way down to the ground. And at the bottom of those ropes were fish hooks. And the young braves would gather and hook those fish hooks to their chest, and they would dance around the totem poles until the rope got so tight that it would draw blood from them. And then when, that, when they couldn't go around any further, they would turn and go in the opposite direction. And they would continue to do that for about an hour until they got a signal from their leader, and then they would leap back and the hook would be torn from their flesh. And then they would all line up and their leader would give them a handshake and thank them for the sacrifice that they made on behalf of the entire tribe. And just as witch doctors can use chicken blood for the atonement of the, their people's sin, these people all know intuitively that there has to be blood, there has to be that sacrifice for their sin. So I'm just thankful that we live in the direct light and we know the truth and we know that God has already paid that sacrifice so we don't have to go through these rituals. Thank you. If you're following along your Bibles, turn to 1 John 3, verses 18. It's a short verse. 1 John 3, 18, but a good one. It says, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. But what does it mean to love others in deed? I mean, love. It's a complicated word, isn't it? We use it for a lot of things. I love peas. Some people love ice cream. You, you go to your friends, hey, I love you, man. Or, hey, I love you. I really do. Or, or 
then there's, there's the more intimate, like your family, I love you. Or it's something you write on a Christmas card. And then you get, you get closer to people and then like an intimate relationship, I love you, will you marry me? Or there's so many different uses for the word love and we use it so much. Some people we even use it sarcastically, like I love it when I have to wake up at 6 in the morning. Like it's... Everybody uses love for so many different things, but what does it really mean to love indeed? According to 1 John 3.18, love isn't just a word. It's an action. But what does that mean? What action is it that we need to love people with? It says not to love in word or in tongue. Have you ever heard the common phrases that we hear, in, that I've heard in the church so many times, I've even been guilty of saying them sometimes, is I love that person, I just don't really like them that much. Or, I love you just because the Bible tells me so. I'm going to love you because the Bible says I have to. But is that love? Or is that just speaking love that isn't true? See, the Bible says to love in deed and in truth. So that means we need to act according to the truth of God's word. The truth of what God's word says love is. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7 tells us. It's one of the most common quoted chapters. The love chapter. Love is patient, kind, not jealous or boastful, not proud, not rude. It doesn't demand its own way. It's not irritable. Keeps no record of wrongs. It doesn't rejoice about injustice, but it rejoices with truth. It never gives up. It never loses faith. It's always hopeful, endures through every circumstance. True love never fails, according to 1 Corinthians 13. But still, that doesn't really show us what action. So the Bible says that God is love. So God is our example of what love needs to look like. He sent his son as an example of love. But what are some of the characteristics of the way we've seen God treat his people in the Bible? We see an unconditional kindness. It doesn't matter what the people did. He was always still there. He was all still willing to be kind, to be able to love his people. A giving with a no expect of return. God poured into his people. He poured out blessing. He, he always loves to bless his people. Even, even when the people aren't always there to receive it, he always is waiting to bless them. Sometimes we choose not to accept God's blessings, but they're still there. And most of all, he forgives when it's undeserved. I know I didn't deserve to be forgiven of the things that I've done in my past. But he still forgave me. So we're supposed to show our love for others by our actions, and not just our words. But, I mean, do we need to forgive everybody? Do we need to love everybody? The Bible said God loved the world, the whole world, all of them, and he wants us to love the same way that he did. But, how do you do that? How do you love everyone? I mean, what about that annoying person that's always talking too much? What about that person that hurt you? Or what about that person that said something about you that you didn't like? Or what about those people that turn against you? Or the people that don't reciprocate your love? What about the people that you've given gifts to and they didn't thank you at all? Do we still have to love those people? God did it for me. And that's what... In John, 1 John 4, 19, it sums it all up. It says that we love because he first loved us. And that's how it works. We don't need to, see, the Bible tells us we need to love people, but it's not our job to just try to love people. I can't, I can't just automatically love the people that aren't easy to love. It doesn't work that way because in my mind, in my fleshly nature, I don't want to love people. I don't like to love people, but when I spend time with my creator, when I spend that time, and because he first loved me, I spend time in that love of God, that's when I want to go out and love people. I can't help but pour out my love on the people that are around me because I am so excited about the love of God that is in my life. Because he didn't stop loving me whenever I turned on him. He didn't stop loving me whenever I betrayed him. He didn't stop loving me when I did the things that he didn't like. So why do I have a right to stop loving you when you've offended me? Why do I have a right to stop loving you 
Whenever you've said something that I didn't like, why do I have a right to stop loving you just because you might have said something that annoyed me or because you talk too much or you have a habit that I don't agree with? I don't. But because God loves me, I love others. And that's what God wants us all to do. We don't love just because we're supposed to love or because the Bible says we have to or because it's the right thing to do. We love because God loves us. John, 1 John 4, 10 through 11 says, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And beloved, if God so loved us, so also should we love one another. Good morning, class. The scripture we're going to be reading from is from Psalm 139. The title of this is Mirror, Mirror. In Psalm 139, I start with verse 13 through 18. It says, For the creation of my inner being, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in that secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, you saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were not written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I wake, I am still with you. The subject is self-view. When was the last time you looked in the mirror and were happy with what you saw? How is it that we should view beauty? When you're a beautiful person on the inside, nothing in the world can change it about you. Jealousy is the result of self-confidence, self-worth, and self-acceptance. If you can't accept yourself, then certainly no one else will. God loves you as you, you are. As a people, we have been created by God. We are infinite precious to him because of his creation, regardless of our outward appearance. We were all made with a spiritual potential to relate directly to him, spirit to spirit. Beauty shouldn't be about changing yourself to achieve the idea to be more sociably acceptable. Real beauty, the interesting and truly pleasing kind, is about honoring the beauty within you. Society has put an image on people that have affect the way people may see themselves and have forgotten the inner beauty is what is truly important, the way God sees them every day, he, the value he has on their character, the image society has brought. Thanks to the media, we have become accustomed to extremely rigid, unformed standards of beauty, standards of beauty that have in fact become harder and harder to achieve. Prickly for women. The current media ideal of thinness for women is achieved by less than 5% of female populations, and these images affect more than adults and adolescents, it's affecting young girls. In 1970, the physically perfect woman was about five foot four and weighed nearly 140 pounds. Even 25 years ago, top models and beauty queens only weighed about 8% less than the average woman. Now it weighs 23% less. The current media idea for women is achieved by less than 5% of female population, and that's just in terms of weight and size. If you want to add shape, face, the works, it's probably more about 1%. I have scholars who study from around the world. Women over 18 looking at themselves in the mirror research indicate 80% of them are unhappy with what they see. Three, only three girls out of 10 have, not, have gone on a diet. And out of, the eight, out of 10 of them will be unhappy for what they are seeing in the mirror. 14 year olds focus specifically dissatisfaction have particularly concerning their hips and thighs. And 50% of 13 year old girls are unhappy with their parents, and up to two-thirds of underweight 12-year-old girls consider themselves to be fat. An American survey showed that 81% of 10-year-old girl girls had already died at least once in their life. A Swedish study showed that 25% of 7-year-olds had died to lose weight, and similar studies in Japan have focused that 41% of elementary school as young as 6-year-olds thought they were fat. There's a society image is infecting us with an affection. And with the media's help, we no longer see ourselves as we should. We no longer see the beauty we have with the flaws that I has placed on us. Many girls struggle to get the image they can't achieve and go to extreme measures. 
Girls today are succumbing to potentially life-threatening tactics, including anorexia, bulimia, and crash dieting in order to transform themselves and society defines as beautiful. These disorders are complex conditions that are caused by a variety of factors, including physical, psychological, interpersonal, and social issues. People in general have a low self-esteem, self-worth, and self-image, and self-love. They do not think they are very good. They do not love themselves and do not accept themselves the way they are. They lack that self-confidence. And I know the effect of society because I, too, struggled with having an eating disorder. I would look in the mirror and see myself as fat when, in reality, I was underweight. I would have people invite me over the house to go swimming, and I would refuse to because I would see me as fat. But I could hear them mumble when I would go, is she anorexic? I can see the bones in her body. But every night after that, I would go home and still look myself in the mirror and say, that is not what they are saying, and that is a lie. I am still fat. But there is an image that matters, and that image is God's view of us. God created us with an image, and we can't deny his handiwork in us. We are wonderfully made by our God. You may not look so favorable on your outward appearance, but when God looks at you, he sees his beautiful daughter. While God cares deeply about our personal struggles and with our outward appearance, whatever they may be, he even cares more for you. Your outward appearance does not change God's acceptance of you. It certainly does not change the way he feels about you. He does not care so much about how we look, but more about our compassion towards each other. It's what's on the inside that counts to God. 1 Peter 3, 3-4 three, three, tells us, Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothing. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is great worth in God's sight. God sees us as his chosen people in 1 Peter 2, 9. It says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him and out of darkness into his wonderful light. Society has put this image on people and have affected the way they see themselves and have forgot the inner beauty. Beauty shouldn't be about changing yourself to achieve the idea of be, to be more social acceptable. Real beauty, the interesting and truly pleasing kind, is about honoring the beauty within you. No longer letting society influence the way you look, but letting God influence the way you should appear to others. Women of God can never be like women of the world. The world has enough women who are tough. We need women who are tender. The world has enough women who are coarse. We need women who are kind. There are enough women who are rude. We need women who are refined. We need women who are not fame and fortune, but we need more women of faith. We have enough greed. We need more godliness, goodness. We have enough vanity. We need more virtue. We have enough popularity. We need more purity. I leave you with this. As a result of the things that have happened in the past, women seem to find it hard to trust anybody. They are so worried that people will somehow dislike them if they are, have the courage to be themselves. They are convinced of society's idea that you have to be thin to be beautiful. But you know what, my sister? You are beautiful as you are. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And my, we're going to go straight to the word. Thank you, God, for this m opportunity. And our verse is going to, our uh, scripture is going to be 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1 through 7. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1 through 7. But I'm just going to read from, from verse 1 to 4 instead. And that is 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1 through 4. The wife of a woman from the company of the prophet cries out to Elijah, Your servant, my, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditors is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. The wife, Elijah replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servants have nothing there at all. She said, except a low oil. Elijah said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask just for just a few. 
Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your servant and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. Verse 4. She, she left him and shut the door behind her and her son. They brought the jar to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were filled, she said to her son, bring me another one. And the title of my sermon today is, I'm going out anyways. I'm coming out anyways. I'm coming out anyways. So in situation, we find ourselves, uh, uh, have you ever been desperate? You, you, you want to get out of a situation? You might, you might even ask everybody around you. You might find uh, your mom. You might find your dad. You, you, you want to ask anybody. Sometimes you ask the wrong person, and they make it into a room. And throughout it all, it, may, it embarrass you. But this is the same situation. This lady, she was in a situation. She, she wanted, she, she had gone through a tough time and the tough time is like she was first of all her husband had died when you look at the uh, when you look at Josephus a uh, little bit of Josephus stories Josephus make us recognize that this lady could be related to she could be the husband she could be the husband I mean the wife of Obadiah when you hear the story of Obadiah, Obadiah was the man that was uh, helping the uh, people of the company of the prophet, the, the student from the company of the prophet, because uh, uh, it, Jezebel was after them. When Jezebel was after them, so they had to find somewhere to be secure. So he was taking care of them. If we look at that, we find in our life, sometimes we might be in a bind. She was in a bind. She, first of all, they wanted her family. They, they wanted to get her, her two, daughters, uh, two sons. I don't want you to misplace it with the story of Elijah. Elijah was the prophet when he, he the lady that came to him had only one son. She had oil and bread. But this lady, she was so desperate. She had only just oil. She only had oil. So she came up to the prophet. She asked him. Sometimes you find the wrong person to ask. And they humiliate you. And they, my, you might find yourself in a bind to the point that they tell about, tell everybody, and they're not really helping. But this girl, this lady knows who to call because she, she knows in God, the prophet of God is the right person to call. So she asked him. So the credibility of, uh, of the prophet of God is because they, they always have an answer. And God always have an answer. God was the one, when we look in the book of Matthew, he was the one who opened, made, uh, he made, he fed 5,000. He has a credibility. He does have an ability to make everything possible. Now we look at this lady. She, she heard what the prophet said. When the prophet told her what she had to do, she listened to what the prophet said. Had she listened to the prophet and known what, she, what, what he had said, one thing she put in her mind is like, okay, I listen. Now I need to do what the prophet said. What the prophet asked her first is, what do you have in your house? She said, I only have an oil. And when she said to him, I only have an oil, then the prophet said to her, then this is what you're going to do. So when she, she listened to what the prophet said, she left the house of the prophet, the house of the prophet. She went to the, her house. When she got to her house, she began to do exactly as the prophet says. So she obeyed. Just like the story of just king, uh, the king that heard the bad news. When he heard the, that bad news, he just didn't, he didn't even hear whatever it was the bad news. He just put it before the Lord. And the Lord tell him to do something. What you gonna do? You're gonna put your worship leaders in front of, in front of the, in front 
front of the battlefield. When he did that and he became victorious, when we look at the situation, out of it all, she came victorious. She had more than enough to even spare because she, first of all, she got to the point she paid for her creditor and she also paid so that she can live forever long. Now we get to this conclusion. This conclusion I want you to understand quickly that there's an equation for you to understand when you ask the Lord, when you seek his face, when you understand him and when you listen and when you obey, he will supply more than enough. And there's something that Pastor, Pastor Kelvin Kelvin Kevin Moore spoke about it. He has an equation. He called it uh, me plus God is more than enough. So I'm going to put it this way. My obedience towards God is more than enough. She had more than enough. So we can have more than enough. And I pray that you would understand that word. May God bless you. Good morning. If you would open your Bibles with me to Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15. The title of my message is Don't Get an Infection. Once again, our text is in Matthew 6, 14 and 15, and it reads, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. So my subject today is forgiveness. And how, do, how can we respond to hurts? So how many of you guys have ever had a splinter? Did it hurt? I'm sure that we've all had a splinter at some point in our lives. The other day, I got home, and I was looking at my finger, and there's this random piece of thread on it. And I went to pull it off, and it didn't move. And I was like, what? Like, I didn't know if there was something sticky on my finger or what was going on. and. So I'm trying to pull the thread off and it's not coming. And then I realized that the thread was attached to a splinter in my finger that I didn't even know I had. So then I had to take the splinter out. And in order to do that, I had to like, you know, dig it out with a needle and all that fun stuff, which made it hurt. But since I took the splinter out, my finger is healed. So what do you think would have happened if I had never, uh, if I had never noticed the splinter being there? I mean. It didn't hurt. If it hadn't been for the thread that was attached to it, I wouldn't have even known it was there. However, splinters that are left untreated will eventually get infected. Just as a splinter in our flesh will infect our body, in our text, Matthew 6.15, we see that if we do not forgive others, God will not forgive us, which is an infection spiritually. How do you deal you, you don't have to be infected. How do you deal with the hurt people cause you? Well, there's a couple different ways you can deal with hurt. You can deal with it by being merciless and unforgiving. We can let the hurts that others have caused us lead us to an attitude of unforgiveness. Unforgiveness leads to bitterness. And when we're filled with bitterness, we have a bad attitude. We have anger and even hatred towards others, specifically those who have hurt us. In Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, the Bible says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as, Christ, just as in Christ God forgave you. I personally have my own experience with unforgiveness and bitterness. When I was an adolescent, my parents got divorced, and I did not forgive my dad for leaving my family. I was so mad that I let the root of bitterness take root in me because of my unforgiveness. The thing is though, I didn't know I was bitter. I knew that when I said I loved my dad, I was just saying it because I felt like I had to say it. I felt like it was the right thing to do. But in my heart, I didn't really feel like I loved him. Then one day, God showed me that I was bitter towards my father. And it was up to me then to decide if I was gonna let God remove that bitterness or not. Just as a splinter I had in my finger would have gotten infected had it not been taken out, I was infected with bitterness because I hadn't let 
forgiveness in, and I had let the unforgiveness stay in me towards my dad. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, 14, and 15, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of grace, the grace of God, and no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Another way that we can deal with hurts is by being merciful and forgiving. We don't have to let ourselves become infected. If we forgive people that have hurt us, God will forgive us, which is like taking out the splinter before an infection can occur. Sometimes we think that we can't just forgive somebody because they've hurt us so badly. Sometimes we think they've hurt us so badly that they don't deserve our forgiveness. Sometimes we let our Sometimes we don't forgive people. We think we can't forgive people because we don't feel like it. We let our emotions rule our decisions. The thing about our emotions is they can change at any second. One minute we're happy, the next minute we're sad. So we can't really follow our feelings. We, we sometimes think that we can't forgive somebody because they've hurt somebody that that we love and that we care about. We pick up someone else's burden and aren't willing to forgive because we see the pain that our loved one is in. And the Bible says in Colossians 3, 13 and 14, bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you and over all these virtues put on love which binds all things together in perfect unity. God wants us to realize that even when we're hurt that we're supposed to love and forgive. Forgiveness is not about a feeling or emotion. It's about a choice. We have the choice to walk in our, in our unforgiving attitude and become filled with bitterness or to walk in forgiveness and enjoy the peace and joy that comes from the Father through his forgiveness. In my personal example earlier, I told you about a time when I let bitterness fill my heart. I couldn't tell my dad I loved him and actually mean it. I decided to let God remove that bitterness, although it meant I had to, go, to let go of all the hurt and the feelings I had held on to for so long but I knew I wanted to be made whole. God took all those feelings and replaced them with the true love for my dad that I had not felt since I was a young child. God doesn't want us to harbor unforgiveness because it is an infection that will eat away at us until it steals our joy, our peace, and our love. The Bible says in John 15, 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. God does not give us permission to hold on to grudges. He tells us we have to love everyone even our enemies. In fact, Matthew 5, 44, says, Jesus says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. We can see how when left unattended, unforgiveness can infect us, but are we willing to, to do what Christ has called us to do? When we're faced with a hurt, we can be merciless and hold on to that grudge. We can let ourselves become bitter and angry towards that person who has hurt us or someone that we love, or we can let ourselves show the same mercy that Christ has given us. We can forgive and let go of the hurt and let God bring the healing that only, he can, that only he can do. We can forgive through God's love. In closing, I would like to share 1 John 4, 11 and 12 with you. It says, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made perfect in us. Good morning, everyone. If you could all turn to Isaiah 43, 18 through 19. And again, that's Isaiah 43, 18 through 19. It says, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Have any of you ever had a friend that, like, always talks about the past memories you have together? 
I was talking about the things you used to do together and how great those times were. But they don't really like make an effort to do new things with you and make new memories. They're just too busy living in the past to you know, live in, in your life right now. Sometimes we do this in our own lives. We think about how much we miss the good old days when we used to do th sinful things. Or maybe we regret the things that we did. But to, to say that we enjoyed the things of our past, like to glorify the sins of our past, is to say that a life of, in God is not as fulfilling as a life of sin. And we can't have that kind of mindset. If we don't recognize that giving up sinful things is not actually giving up anything, it's gaining freedom and happiness in Christ, then we'll have a much harder time giving up those things if we don't recognize that. But at the same time, we shouldn't condemn ourselves for what we used to do so much that we just don't move on in God. <clears throat> so many of us are walking around with a load of regret that we let the things we wish we hadn't done shape our opinions of ourselves. We even let it shape the way we think that God sees us. We think that somehow the sins of our past have tainted our future. We think that, you know, maybe because we've committed this big, big sin that we have cheapened our value to God. And that's exactly what Satan wants you to think. But nothing you, can, nothing you do will ever change the way that God feels about you. Because when God looks at you, he doesn't see the bad things in your past. He sees your future potential. God will never hold your past against you. In fact, we're the ones that are holding our failures against ourselves. We ask God for, for forgiveness, but we don't even forgive ourselves. We think that even though God has forgiven us, we're still, you know, that girl or that guy. But God's not like that. When you ask for forgiveness, he casts, it in, he casts your sins in the sea of forgetfulness. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for mine own sake and remembers your sins no more. If God doesn't even remember your sins, why should you? God's never going to bring up your past and hold it against you. <clears throat> Oftentimes, we tend to think that when God's looking at us, he's thinking, oh, wow, look at them trying to worship me. Don't they remember what they did yesterday? But in reality, he's looking at us with love, and he's thinking, wow, look at them. They remember what I did for them on Calvary. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person, the old life is gone, and new life has begun. You've become a new person in Christ. When an alcoholic changes his lifestyle and stops drinking, you can't call him an alcoholic anymore, right? It's the same way with us. When you get saved and you start to work on changing your lifestyle, you're no longer that old person. People can't call you a sinner anymore because you're a saint. <laughs> when we accept Christ into our lives, he, make, he remakes us. He changes something inside of us so that we don't think the way we used to think, we don't act the way we used to act, and so on. <clears throat> but you see, Satan wants, Satan knows that if we, he can keep our minds in bondage, he can keep us living in condemnation. He can keep us from realizing how much value we have in God. And if we think that we are of no value to God, we will not be effective in ministry. Oftentimes we think that somehow we have done so much bad that God cannot possibly use us as if somehow our sin outweighs God's grace. That like our, our sin is so much more powerful than God's power. But God tells us not to dwell on our past, but to look hopefully towards the future plans he has for us. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a, a hope and a future. So stop living in your past and start living for your future. Good day, everyone. I believe that everyone's having a very good day, especially when it's a homiletic speaking day. My title that I have for today is, Without Love, We Are Nothing. The, the text I'm going to read from is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. 
1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 for 3. Well, you guys to turn your pages or scrolling your pages down. The, the, the place I got this kind of sermon from was when I was up in the senior room, I saw the commission board, and it said that if you go and you give to the poor the clothes and the food, but if you do not love, it basically profits you nothing. It has nothing. It's not as effective as the love. And the scripture says, Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I become in the sound of brass of a clean symbol. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand in all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned, but lo- have not love, it profits me nothing. So why is it so hard to do some things with love? I think it is, for me, sometimes I have a hard time doing things with love. You know what I'm saying? Uh, say if I'm, having, if I'm eating and I'm in the cafeteria, I'm full. It doesn't happen very often, but it does happen once in a while. And I have a piece of cake that I kind of... That I don't really want to eat, but I don't want to give, throw it away, so I kind of give it to someone. And I just give it to someone without really loving it, without really pro- letting it profit me anything, because I really don't want it anyways. So I just give it away. So if I give it to Frank or something, I don't really want it. But say if I'm doing something that's, that I love to do, like going over and help my brother-in-law build his uh, Ford when he's renovating it. I'm surprised this Ford still there today, but I just kind of go, go there and help it because I love doing it. It profits me something to be able to go out there and throw my love to him and show that I love my brother-in-law and I want to help him out. And there's a couple things in the Word of God. Because just as the Scripture says, if we do anything but not love, we are nothing. Let's do things with love. So just as so that people can see us throw out that love and they can see not us but Jesus with inside of us. We have Abel and Cain. Back in Genesis 2, I believe it was, they both brought up some first, they both brought up uh, offerings to the Lord. Abel brought up the, his first flock, it was nice and good. Then Cain brought up his, uh, his, his fruit, but it wasn't really his greatest. And this point is, obedient is better than disobedient. Abel was being obedient and gave his best to God, and God accepted. But we have Cain, who brought not his best, but it was kind of like him kind of being disobedient. When uh, Ahab was obedient, he, God offered and accepted, and he continued to show love to God afterwards. It profited him a lot to be able to give his best to God. But then we see Cain, who didn't bring his best to God, his offering. God didn't really, God didn't accept it. And there could be a couple of different reasons. But the thing was that when God didn't accept it, he allowed that whatever love he had inside him to turn to anger, and he went on killing his own brother. And another point for the love factor is fellowship is better than distraction. So we have, say if we have Murpha and Mary, and uh, Murpha goes out and she sees Jesus walking, and she brings Jesus right on in to her house. Then we also have uh, and Mary, who is also within this house. And Mary, she chose the wisest one. She took, uh, she took time to fellowship with Jesus and continued just to be with Jesus. She loved the t- fact that she was with Jesus. She had fellowship with him and left that love that she had be able to pour out to him. And what she was doing profited a whole lot more than what Murpha was doing. What Murpha was doing was running around. Even though she was pr- loving what she was doing, serving, she allowed what she was loving to distract her of what, Je- what the reason why Jesus was there. She lost the focus of it, and therefore the distraction made her go to Jesus, say if me and Mark are having a conversation, and Sherry comes on over, and she's serving everyone, and she's like, yo, Jesus, can't you tell my sister, yo, to go help me out? And Jesus basically is like, whoa, what Mary has been doing will not be lost. It will profit her a lot. But what you're doing will kind of not profit you as much. But so that's how sometimes we can get distracted. And sometimes even like when we're in Bible school, we can get distracted with all the homework and everything that's going on. But we gotta keep, gotta keep the main focus on is having a fellowship with Jesus. The line of love, and it'll profit us a whole lot more. We will profit us within our spiritual life that we can go out and be able to help the other folks. And uh, I want I'm gonna get my brother Mark over here. Just to kind of to close off, I'm gonna pretend he just to kind of show this. 
as, well, as my own little personal testimony, we have Mark over here as my youth leader. Say, I'm the youth leader. I'm the youth leader. Oh, come on, brother. And uh, Saint, he's, like, back about 2014, he would have been one of my youth leaders, and they took their busy time and their schedule and made up a plan. Just kind of make up a plan, you know, something. And uh, during, and there was a weekend in a, a youth rally, and uh, he, instead, he was so busy, but even though he was busy, he did not allow that to kind of distract him, and he pour, poured love and to the kids. Thank you, brother. You may sit down. <laughs> and also, therefore, my youth leaders pouring the love into me, even though they're busy, it helped me to draw me to make a decision to go and say, you know what, God, this old lifestyle, I don't want to live it no more. I don't want to do the drugs. I don't want to do anything. I don't want to be disobedient. I want to have a fellowship with you. I want to be obedient, God, and I want to do what you've called me to do. And I believe that's why I'm here at Facebook, because I want to do what God is calling me to do. And uh, let's let the, the light that God has given you, let it so shine. Go out there and use that light with the love, and let it shine to the people. Are you willing to do your ministry and still love just as Christ did when he was on the cross?